everyone. Thank you for joining us for The Power of Teamwork. During this panel, a super team of creators will talk about collaboration in kids comics. My name is Betsy Gomez, and I'm the coordinator for the Band Book Suite Coalition. I'll be your moderator today. This panel is sponsored by the CBC Graphic Novel Committee. The committee is composed of publishing professionals committed to expanding the presence and legit legitimacy for children's and young adult graphic novels. Before I introduce the panelists, I would like to thank Comic-Con International for making this discussion possible and including it in Comic-Con at home. All right, the first member of our super team is Jean Yang. Jean began making comics and graphic novels in fifth grade. Jean's 2006 release, American Born Chinese, from first, second books, became the first graphic novel to be nominated for the National Book Award and the first to win the American Library Association's Prince Award. Jean also wrote Dark Horse Comics continuation of the popular Nickelodeon cartoon Avatar, The Last Airbender, and for DC Comics, he's written Superman, including the recently released, recently collected Superman Smashes the Clan. Should I say right. hi? Hi, Gene. Hi. <laughs> I don't know what the protocol was, so. <laughs> <laughs> All good. All right, next up, uh, we have Jim Ottaviani. Hopefully I didn't just slaughter your last name. So close. <laughs> so close. Okay, how should I say it? Oh, it's fine. Ottaviani. Okay. Ottaviani. Okay. Uh, Jim began writing nonfiction, science-oriented comics in 1997, notably Hawking, The Imitation Game, a also great graphic novel for teens, Feynman, and Fallout, which was nominated for an Ignatz Award. Jim has teamed up with artist and writer Maris Wicks, who is also a member of our, our super team today, on two acclaimed projects, Primates, about primatologist Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, and Brute uh, Galticus, and the recently released Astronauts Woman on the Final Frontier. The New York Times bestselling writer has received praise from publications ranging from Nature and Physics World to Entertainment Weekly and Variety. Jim has worked as a nuclear engineer, caddy, programmer, and reference librarian. He lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan. All right. And Maris Wicks is a writer and illustrator of science comics, as well as a self-proclaimed gigantic nerd. She has written, drawn, and colored comics for First Second, the New England Aquarium, and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, as well as SpongeBob Bob Comics, Marvel, and DC. Wicks is the illustrator of the New York Times bestselling book, Primates, and the recently released Ast Astronauts, both of which were written by Jim. Her graphic novel, Human Body Theater, is a rollicking romp through the major systems of the human body, and Maris also wrote and drew science comics, Coral Reefs, for First Second. When she's not busy making comics, Maris can be found prepping slides for her collection of vintage microscopes, traveling, scuba diving, hiking, and baking cookies, though never all of those things at once. <laughs> she was a program educator at the New England Aquarium for eight years and the science outreach communicator for Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution on board the RV Atlantis for Popping Rocks cruise in March, April of 2016. She also traveled to Antarctica as a part of the USAP Artists and Writers Grant, working on a graphic novel about life and science in our coldest continent. <laughs> Hi, Maris. All right, and the final member of our team today is Chad Sell. Chad's first children's graphic novel was The Cardboard Kingdom, which he illustrated and co-wrote with a team of 10 collaborators. The same team came together again to create the Cardboard Kingdom, Roar of the Beast, and Chad's first full-length solo project, Doodleville, is set in Chicago, where he lives with his husband and two cats. Hi. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Stop sharing so we can have a conversation. Okay, first question. Uh, why are comics an ideal format for showing teamwork? Maris, you want to kick us off? So I was so excited when I saw the theme for the panel because there's a lot of things that comics can do that it's not that not other media can do, but comics can do it incredibly well. And when you're showing a scene where whether it's a bunch of scientists working together or a team of playing a sport, this is the unique ability for comics to show the whole thing happening, but then to also see the individual connections between players or folks working together. Um, and I think 
if I were to write something like that in prose, it would be incredibly difficult because you have that jump around between people. So I think comics can do this, this show and not tell of what it's like to be on a team and to either solve problems or to work together to do something. Thanks, Paris. Uh, Jean, Chad, Jim, what do you think? Well, I, I know in, uh, in prose novel writing, it's kind of like what Mara said, uh, showing different perspectives of different characters can sometimes seem very cumbersome. I mean, uh, they, they call it like head hopping, right? Like if, you, if you're too close to this one character and then you move on to another character, uh, and, and usually that's seen as a bad thing. But in comics, you can show thought balloons and you can show captions, like thought captions that belong to different characters all in the same panel. And it's seen as a, a part of the medium. It's not really seen as a mistake the way head hopping is in, in novel writing. Yeah, and, yeah and, I think what Jean, go ahead, Chad. Oh, sorry. Um, another aspect I think is the, the emotional literacy of comics um, that comics allow us to kind of simplify and distill emotion in our illustrations. And so as kids or as characters are working together and, and interacting with each other, it, you can, as a storyteller, you can really crystallize exactly what each character is feeling at that moment. Um, that's something that I, I really, really strive in, to, to do in my, my drawings. And, and I've been told by educators that, you know, comics can be great for kids who are reluctant readers or, or even, you know, speak English as a second language, that those visual cues are so helpful in decoding the story and, and relating to it. And, and I hope it, I'm hoping that it really encourages like a greater level of emotional literacy. Mm -hmm. Chad, Jim? Yeah, I think, I think all of those things are right. And to maybe build on all of them, uh, one of the things that I love most about comics is, the, is their capability for layering information. So uh, Chad, Gene, and Maris all, all alluded to this. You can have thoughts presented simultaneously with you know, dialogue, presented simultaneously with action. And all of those things can come together to get across fairly difficult uh, to portray concepts or just person to person interactions. And as good as they are for kids, which I totally agree, I don't wanna, I mean, we're, we're talking mostly about kids comics, but that sort of layering makes comics particularly enjoyable for me as an adult as well, because you can have so many things going on at the same time. And especially as an adult who might want to, might be reading comics with a kid, uh, it actually helps a little, you're, you're going to get less, you're going to be less bored <laughs> if there's more going on in the page or the panel on the 17th reading, because there's always more stuff to discover and see and engage with. Did we lose Betsy? Oh. Hey. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. I think my uh, I, my signal just uh, um, froze. So, um, okay. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's talk uh, let's talk about why it's important to model teamwork in kids' comics. Jean, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's a important, like it's just a necessary part of the future. You know, uh, I think um, the world has gotten so complicated that when you're trying to build something. Uh, you need a whole team to work together to, to, to build that. And that's even the, the comic itself. I think in independent comics in America, um, we've, we've had this tradition of having one person kind of be in charge of the writing and the drawing and sometimes even the publishing. But even with that, even when you are doing a project that's considered a solo project, you still need people to work alongside you. So everything in the world is like that now because the complexity that's in, inherent in living today. So I think kids need to learn that and comics are a great way for them to learn how to work as a team. Mm -hmm. Can, Can, I, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Can I speak on uh, thinking about being a kid and dreading team projects? Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I actually, I played soccer for nine years and I absolutely loved soccer because I could choose to be, mm -hmm. not, I, I was a keeper, which is like kind of perfect. If anybody knows me, I'm like in the back, just like, uh, but then like, ah, but uh, I, I was really shy as a kid and I dreaded working together, but I do think that seeing 
teamwork modeled and the things that I interacted with helped me understand how to work with other people. And it wasn't until I became, I think actually probably the biggest example of like having fun working as a team was my first job. I was a dishwasher in a bakery and like I understood all the components of what it took to make the place work. And then I also understood that like we all got trained to like get on register if someone needed to, or to like hop on the griddle if you were doing like window service instead of washing stuff. So the, the, a lot of times you don't experience being a team until you're in it. It's very like hands-on visceral experience. So it's, it's nice to see different types of team. And it doesn't, again, like when I say team, like a lot of times we think of sports, but I think about, um, you know, even just coming together with multiple people to solve a problem. And maybe it's just like to build a table or something like that. But I think, I think there's an inherent hands-on um, an active dynamic quality to teamwork, whether it's whatever flavor. Um, so again, like for me, seeing it modeled in different types of media was really helpful for me to be able to see how I could be part of a team as a young person, even if it meant passive versus active, like figuring out like, okay, well, I'm shy, but maybe I'd like to make the outline or write and like, just, just kind of like figuring out the process, process part. Hey, thanks, Maris. Chad? Um, well, what I like most about depictions of like teamwork is the friction inherent in it in that different kids, I, I think of kids because Cardboard Kingdom has like nearly 20 kid characters in it. And what I love about an ensemble and showing the kids working to get together is um, how different kids approach things differently, how different kids interpret a problem differently. Um, I like different kids teaching each other new aspects about what they might do to solve the problem um, or even having different approaches and that causing some conflict or even uh, competition about who like, whose solution will actually fit. I, I think that's really, really interesting as a storyteller. I think um, it kind of decentralizes any one person being the hero or being right or having all of the answers. Uh, I, I think that negotiation, as messy as it can be, is where I love finding the heart of all of my stories. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, nice, thanks Chad. Jim, do you have anything to add? Well, uh, just again, building on what Chad just said, I think that's actually one of the main themes of astronauts is the diversity of opinions and diversity of skills and expertise that we saw in a, sh so if you, if you know anything about the space race, um, initially, at least from the outside, it looked like a bunch of solo hero test pilot types going and doing something amazing. But really there was hundreds of thousands of people behind the scenes making all of this possible. You just didn't see that. Maris and I wanted to make a point of depicting not 100,000 people, uh, that's too many for us for a Thanks, comic book page, but a bunch, yeah, right, Maris would have killed me. Um, but a bunch of people, you know, working to solve a problem. And it turns out that the more complicated the mission gets, when, it's not really simple to just go to the moon and come pick up some rocks and come back, but it is a, in fact a lot more complicated to go into outer space, try to figure out how to build a space station out there and then come back with that knowledge and, and have a, fo a follow-up mission do more and eventually build the International Space Station. And so what we wanted to and were able to do was depict how things progressed from sort of that individual ideal to this teamwork uh, sort of situation and how when a bunch of different people come together you start to get new and better solutions to problems than you would have had otherwise. Uh, I can't remember exactly what the line was. This is why we write stuff down, we have books, right? But it's like, uh, there, there is a scene in the book where basically one of the heads says, if I get the same, uh, the same answer from five different people, that's probably not a good idea unless it's like a pure mathematical thing if it has a social or personal aspect, if everybody gives the same answer, it probably means I don't have enough opinions and enough people in the room to get to the right thing. And that was sort of the progression that we, we wanted to depict. And so, you know, 
depicting teamwork for kids is really important. I think it's also important for adults. It, it, the teamwork thing never stops. In fact, it just keeps getting more and more. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to do it more and more. So um, I'd actually like to explore this, uh, this idea of um, depicting conflict um, when it comes to teamwork. Uh, I mean, Chad, you mentioned that is one of your, uh, your most favorite things about showing teamwork, but I'd like to hear from the rest of you guys about how um, kids can learn from the conflicts within teams and how they can learn from the conflicts with rivals and enemies. So anybody wanna volunteer to go first? <laughs> I'll piggyback just because it's related to what Jim was just talking about. Okay. Um, some of my favorite scenes to illustrate in Astronauts was was people knowing what was right and standing up for what was right. There's a great scene with Carolyn Huntoon where like these NASA guys are just like, this is, these are our demands. And she's like, these are not fair. We've been asking for these things for our women astronauts. Like I need this, this, and this. And she like lays it out there and she does it in like a polite diplomatic way. But I think, I, I don't want to put my mind in her position but like I've been in situations where I know what the right thing to do is but acting on it and using your voice to ask for those things is really scary especially when it's a higher up um, I'm just thinking from like work experience so I think this isn't necessarily conflict resolution but I think this diplomacy but then also just like speaking up and it's hard because there's lots of stuff in history where people have spoke up for things that's really important and they've been silenced or fired or things like that so i i understand that there's a risk associated with um with speaking the truth or speaking to like what is fair and just so i think those parts were really nice to see happen and to also see a 20-year time period where like the women in the book who asked for that stuff, not even as strongly in the 60s, were shut down and told to basically go away. And then you've got the early 80s where it's like, oh, 20 years has definitely changed. So you kind of see history shift over 20 years. So I think, I guess in, in, in that case, I think it's interesting to look at historical change through what, what Jim and I have worked on. Um, I, I can't necessarily perfectly uh, personally speak to conflict parts and I was when Chad was talking about like working together I'm like you were explaining why I hated doing projects as a kid like <laughs> I was the kid that didn't want to ruffle feathers and like didn't want conflict and it was really hard for me to see other kids not get along um so I think it's it's I'll, I'll pass the torch to someone else but I think it's a really good question like how do we address conflict resolution and and working together so everybody gets to be a piece of the the thing well just mm -hmm. in terms of collaboration say with you um, or with any, any of the artists that I've ever work, worked with, the thing, the thing that, the way to address, one way to address it, I shouldn't say the way to address it, but one way to address it is to reframe what the problem is and where the problem lies. And something that you get, we, get, we were able to depict in this story a bunch of times is like, no, it's not about you winning or me winning. It's about having a safe flight in three months or solving this problem when we're you know up on orbit in three months and so bringing it back to the creation of comics it's not about me getting my way or maris getting her way uh when we f fight have we ever fought i don't think we've no. ever fought. <laughs> no but, it's most but, collaboration like critical thinking stuff yeah, so, except that but, one time but, where we sparred in a parking lot. I don't know. I'm just kidding. That didn't oh, I don't remember that. You must have. You must have knocked me out. Oh, I won. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, good. Just kidding. Um, but but when we have a disagreement over where it should be, the thing we both have been able to do or want always want to do is step back and say, if we fight, let's call it a fight. If we disagree. The resolution of the agreement is not about me getting my way or you getting your way. It's about the story becoming better. So any disagreement has to be resolved so that the story is a better story rather than me feeling like, yeah, I scored a point on that one. Yeah, if, so cl clear. If I ever feel that way, uh, I've blown it. But clear objectives and efficient communication for both mm -hmm. collaborating in comics, but also like trying to portray that. Um, mm -hmm. I'll stop now. Right. 
Thanks, Gene. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly right. So uh, Dragon Hoops, my most recent graphic novel from First Second is about a high school basketball team that I followed for a season. It's a nonfiction book. Uh, and I saw this all over the place during that season. So I was not a basketball player when I was in high school. I was not an athlete at all. The, the thing that I liked to do the most was read and draw comic books, which were things that um, you could do alone, right? I, I, I bet I was kind of like Maris. <laughs> like I was super afraid of, I was super afraid of conflict. I, I think I still kind of am. But watching that team grow and watching that team um, kind of resolve their conflicts, some that ended up in the book, I, I really do think exactly what, what, what Jim said is right. Um, the things that got them through was first a, a common goal they all wanted to win the state championship. And second was uh, putting a premium on, um, on communication. So uh, a, a lot of what those team meetings were about were uh, the, the coaches would see conflict on the court. And a lot of times these kids are young, they don't really know how to talk about it. So the coach would walk them through talking through those, uh, those conflicts. Nice, thanks, Gene. Ted, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I love the idea of communication, like so often being the, the difficulty in communicating so often being the source of conflict or tension, like mm -hmm. you not understanding the other person uh, and that causing troubles down the, down the line. Um, and, and that just clear, effective communication, like candidly discussing what's going on so often is the resolution. Um, and I think, you know, for my work, Empathy is really, really important, like understanding everyone's perspective and that everyone has their own story. Um, I got like an awesome like fan mail earlier this week. In Cardboard Kingdom, there's, there's this bully character who shows up in some early chapters in other kids' stories and, and is the antagonist and causes a lot of trouble. And late in the book, he has his own chapter where you find out a lot more about his home life and what's going on with him and why he acts the way he does. And I was so charmed that this writer who sent in his letter, he said, I, the bully is my favorite character. The next book should have more, more of the bully. And I, I just love the idea that what, what starts out as a villain in the book ends up becoming this kid's favorite character and, and why that might be. Great, thank you. So um, let's talk a little bit about creative collaboration. Uh, I'm actually gonna have Marius and Jim start on this because they have collaborated together um and uh let's talk about how you guys work together as a team and uh in creating primates and um, astronauts and um how that teamwork is reflected in the books you make do you want do you want me to go first do you want to go first <laughs> it's definitely evolved between the two books hmm. yeah it has yeah and i i think part of that is because Good. primates was my first book I didn't know what the etiquette was for talking with the writer. Um, for those of you who don't know in the illustration world, at least with picture books, it's generally discouraged. <laughs> um, sometimes you're not allowed to, and I understand the reasons for that sometimes, but in comics, it's incredibly collaborative. I was also super nervous, first book. Um, but we, and when that book happened, texting really wasn't a thing. <laughs> so like we didn't text because it was a while ago. Um, so we'd email. I mean, we had met in person a couple times, but for astronauts, as soon as I finished Primates, I was like, oh my gosh, can we please work together again? And you had told me like, Astronauts was like an inkling. And I was like, oh, I want to do this book. So you sent me more initial drafts of Astronauts. I didn't necessarily weigh in. I just like got to researching and was really getting my head in the book and how I would approach it. And I know what, what Jim and I talked about, you, you knew that I was going to be the illustrator for Astronauts. So I don't know if that affected how you, you wrote the story. Um, 100% it affected how I wrote the story. There are scenes in there that are fan service directly to Maris. Every scene uh, with the space toilet. <laughs> <laughs> yep, the space toilet. There, um, a tiny spoiler, there are primates in uh, astronauts as well. Non-human non primates. Non-human <laughs> primates, thanks. Primates <laughs> without thumbs. Um, and there are bits where as I'm re as I was researching things, it's like fun. And th this is almost always true, you know, fun to draw, not fun to draw. But now I have the added bonus of saying something that I think Maris will like to draw or something that I think Maris won't like to draw. And that helped to make the choices. And you're always making choices. Uh, I'm sure Gene and Chad would 
would both confirm this. Uh, uh, fic fiction, fictionalized books with Chad and, and the latest nonfiction with Gene. But you're always making choices. You've got ideas that you could, you could put in, but eventually some of those don't make it into the final book. Mm -hmm. A lot of the choices that I would make uh, were colored at least by things that I think would be enjoyable for Maris to draw specifically or to be, you know, uh, visual just for comic sake. Um, there were, there are of course occasions and things that's like, I think this is going to be a fairly, this is going to be a talking heads scene. Sorry, there's just no way around it. No, I don't think anybody loves drawing those, but we got, but you know, there's a scene that happens in, in a congressional hearing and there's no way to make that exciting. If any, if any of the adults out there have ever watched C-SPAN, it's like super not visually interesting. Uh, every once in a while, a congressperson will take a sip of water or something. It's just not not awesome for comics. But it had to be there because it, it uh, highlighted one of the obstacles that these women had to overcome. But to get back to, you know, knowing Maris was specifically going to do this, uh, draw this book, meant A, I could get really technical on some of the backgrounds and because she digs that. And also... Uh, we use exaggeration a fair amount to, to heighten the emotion. And that's something that Maris is particularly skilled at. So. Did I surprise uh, you when yeah. I was like, I love drawing the interior of like technical vehicles. Cause I like love the space shuttle. And I also love the inside of the T-38 five, like the jets. And I'm, I'm not sure if you knew that, but I think when I read, when I, I, when I, when I, I read didn't. the script, I'm like, I'm so excited to draw this cockpit. <laughs> Yeah, and, I was I was figuring we'd get get a lot of uh, no background panels, but it turns out quite the opposite. Yeah, and, I yeah, love. I, was geeked. I love technical illustration because I and we talked about this. I like drawing very cartoony people, but if you can draw a very tangible environment for them to exist in, I love that juxtaposition of like somewhat real space, very cartoony person, and you. A lot of people will know some of my influences as a comics maker, like our other uh, uh, creators that do that. Um, but yeah, and I, I'll, I'll end it, or at least end this in exchange, by saying I, I also love writing my own comics, but collaborating with Jim is an awesome experience because he tells stories in the way that I would never think to. This is like a good testament to be like comics people, like every person tells stories a different way. And like you could give Chad and Gene like the same story to tell and they would do it in incredibly different and awesome ways so there's this variable of creative teams or creator and i think it's really fun to explore that to be like you know what can i contribute as an illustrator just as an illustrator in that collaborative aspect versus when i'm working on my solo things like what what am i contributing to the story and i think that's an interest i like to play with that and it's also it's really nice to not have to draw a whole like write a whole book <laughs> so thanks jim <laughs> thanks for doing the heavy lifting on that one <laughs> no problem Thanks. Um, I'm going to sneak in a question for Chad really quick. Uh, I'd actually like to know more about how, uh, how you collaborated on Cardboard Kingdom working with 10 other people. Yeah, that blows my mind. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a really wild, but like very magical and serendipitous experience. Um, I had been pitching my own graphic novels for years and years and just never was quite seeing them that I... I think a big issue was my own confidence and my own uh, like sense of certainty as a storyteller. And um, after a while, you know, I had this idea for Cardboard Kingdom, which is that the book would follow a whole neighborhood of kids and character in that neighborhood. And I really loved this idea, but I wasn't sure who those kids would be. Um, and so for a while, I was just kind of stuck on that and spinning my wheels. And um, in around like 2015, that was kind of when you were seeing early crowdfunding and crowdsourcing um, creative projects online and, you know, different anthologies bringing creators together. And I thought, well, writers are always looking for an artist to draw their story in comics. So what if I have sort of um, uh, an, an internet contest where anyone can send in their story idea for this book that I've pitched? Um, and I had like a sample story and I, I guaranteed, I, you know, I couldn't guarantee that we would ever make any money or that the book would be, but that I would 
uh, your story and it would be out in the world in some way. And so I picked 10, 10 of those pieces and we worked on the whole book together. Uh, with book one, each writer had one or two of their own self-contained stories, but then we work, once each of those moments, tying them all together and having each other's characters show up in each other's stories so that it did feel like a coherent neighborhood. And then we did a few chapters at the end that did unify things and kind of escalate everything into a giant epic finale by the end of summer. It, it was really exciting and magical. Um, I don't think any of them had been published when going journey. Grateful for that because um, if for anyone involved in publishing, there's there are so many periods of waiting and of uncertainty and where everyone like your editor and your publicist they're all doing what they're doing, but they're not necessarily explaining to you what what they're doing. <laughs> Just like. Should I, what should I be doing right now? What should I be thinking about? What should I be worrying about? Is this normal? And having 10 other people go through that, to go through that with and, and sort of be cheerleaders for each other uh, was just really awesome. Worked with the same group for Cardboard Kingdom book two, Roar of the Beast, which will be out next year. Nice. Did nice that answer show. your questions, Patsy? Yeah, yeah, it did, absolutely, thank you. All right, Gene, it's your turn in the hot seat. You've collaborated with a bunch of people. Um, can you tell us about a creative team up that you thought was exceptional? Like, is there, is there a book or a project or a person you worked with that you were just really dug it? I mean, I, I've, had, I've been really lucky. I've worked with some really, really talented people and I could talk about all of them actually. I, I don't think I've had a single person that I've worked with that I didn't like. <laughs> I've, I've, been super lucky. I've been super lucky, but the, the two, most recent projects that I have, uh, Superman Smashes a Clan from DC Comics. I got to work with Guri Hiru and Janice Chang. Guri Hiru is an art team. Um, they're they're uh, two of the most talented artists working in America. I'm sorry, in the world today. They're, they're based out of Japan. Uh, and we had worked on five volumes of Avatar Last Airbender comics together. So by the time we got to uh, Superman Smashes a Clan, I just felt like we were in this real rhythm, you know, like I could there are things that I could just describe with one sentence that I'd probably use a whole paragraph for if I was working with someone else. And I just knew that they would figure it out and they'd be able to, to, to draw something awesome, like way better than I could imagine. And what makes it even crazier is that they don't speak English at all. They don't read English. So it all goes through a translator. But because we're in this rhythm, I felt like I could just trust them. You know, it, it, it made my job a thousand times easier. For, for Dragon Hoops, um, that book about basketball, I wrote and drew that book, but it was colored by one of my good friends, Lark Pian. We'd done uh, two other books before this. Uh, and because we've been working together for a long time as well, for years, um, I, I felt like we were in a rhythm as well. In, in a lot of ways, I felt like I could trust her as well. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the big difference for Dragon Hoops though is that it was the first time where I used um, I, I worked with assistants, you know, like like a manga artist. You know how in Japan they have assistants. So so one of them was a, a really talented um, young woman named uh, Rianne Myers, who she does a a web comic called Fight or Flight. You should check that out. I felt weird about that because she's like a, a way better artist than me. <laughs> like if you look at her stuff, she has a better grasp grasp of anatomy, of of perspective, of all the basics. So to ask her to be my assistant, I felt really weird about it. But she, she did a great job. Um, she um, basically took my, uh, my, um, my thumbnails and then she did really rough like figure placements and, and then the lettering. It was totally beneath her, to be honest. Like given her talent, what I asked her to do was totally beneath her. And then the other um, assistant that I had was my son. I have a 16 year old, his name is Colby. Um, one of the things that I dreaded the most about doing a book about basketball was like the crowd scenes. So I made him do some of those crowd scenes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did the rough outlines of, of you know, like stick figures of where all the, uh, all the people in the crowd would, would be and then I would draw over those, those stick figures. Awesome, thanks, Gene. Yeah. Okay, Jim, I'm gonna have you kick, uh, kick this one off. Um, if you could team up with anyone, artist, writer, scientist, fictional character, anyone, alive, dead, or otherwise, on a comics project, who would it be and why? Yeah, you warned me of this question, and I spent <laughs> the whole week thinking about it, trying to think of an answer that 
uh, would be good. And it's, it's hard not to go back to the folks that I've already collaborated with because I've enjoyed all of them. And so stepping out into the unknown is kind of tough for me. But if I could, if I could do, so let me pick an old, a book that I did a long time ago uh, and say, if Niels Bohr was still alive, I would love to have had a chance to talk with him and collaborate with him. I think it would have ended up being a nightmare because he was not a particularly clear communicator. So this is like purely selfish. I just, I just want to meet him. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I'm, I'm adapting a book right now about the uh, naturalist E.O. Wilson. And this is the first time I've done an adaptation. Uh, and it made the research like super easy because the publisher said, here's the book. Don't leave the book. As in, you know, like, don't go read other stuff. Don't do this. Don't do anything. Just work from this book. It's like, wow, that's very different from the, like, 16-foot-tall stack of reference I have for these other books that I'm working on right now. It's only one. Uh, and that's been actually a really interesting collaboration. It's a little bit tense always to work with somebody who's, a, who's alive. And so the first time you present them with a cartoon version of themselves, uh, you just don't know what's going to happen. Actually, Maris and I had that experience with, uh, with our main character, with Mary Cleave. It's like, okay, uh, we involved her in the process the whole time. So she saw an outline of the script, I think, and then the script itself uh, after it was approved, and then the thumbnails. And she was, you know, she's pretty cool about it. Scientists get this medium, by the way. They really do uh, understand, oh yeah, words and pictures together, no problem. I, I understand why you would want to do that. Uh, let, let's, let's go. Uh, but there's a difference between, you know, seeing a cartoon version of yourself and the, the self-image that you have. So that's always a little bit tense, I guess. Uh, but anyway, get, getting back to Wilson, he was also happy, uh, I think, he said he was, uh, with the, the cartoon images uh, and depiction of himself. So that's fun. I still haven't answered your question really. I mean, it's, it's hard to go, it's, it's hard. I'm, lo I'm looking across the, the room here. Actually behind me is a, is a lithograph by Alan Bean. Uh, this is something he called what it felt like to walk on the moon and he was a character in an earlier book and I got to talk to Alan Bean and Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to do a book I uh, got to got to talk with Mary Cleave we we actually hung out Maris Mary and I uh, went to a pub uh, I, fan, I fangirled out pretty hard I'm like you've yeah, got the was... space <laughs> What are you doing? What are you doing here? I had like zero, you a beer? zero cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'm. I, th I think I'm going to get it like a C minus on that answer, right? I kind of, sort of gave you words. Uh, B minus. B minus. <laughs> Thanks. I think you're. I think you're a really generous grader. Uh, uh, because, you know, uh, I'm looking at doing a couple other books right now. Um, and it would be great if some of the people in those were alive, but some of them are alive and uh, have already talked to, to folks. Mm -hmm. So there's just, it's hard to choose. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, I probably just moved that to C plus. I should stop talking. <laughs> no, thank you, Jim. Uh, Jean Chai, what do you think? Who would you team up with? Go ahead. Um, one of the the best parts of having a kids book out in the world is doing school visits and getting to meet kids mm -hmm. and uh, do drawing demos for them and give them give them talks. And my very favorite thing is seeing their art. Um, you know, Cardboard Kingdom is all about kids creating their own cardboard costumes to play out an, a fantastical alter ego. So at presentations, I asked the kids, would you be a hero or a villain in the cardboard kingdom? What would your character be? And 
can you bring that character to life, like in the costume or by drawing them and maybe even doing a comic about them? So I am like endlessly entertained and inspired by what kids come up with, uh, with their own characters of them dressed up as these kids, uh, as these characters. Um, and I think it would be tremendously awesome at some point if I keep doing the Cardboard Kingdom series to do a bunch of stories or characters based on the, the characters that kids create themselves. Nice. There, there are a, a ton of people that I would uh, love to collaborate with. Um, I am actually doing a project right now with Jason Shiga, who is, I mean, we're friends, but he's also like, even if I hated him as a human being, I would love him as a cartoonist because he's just, I think he's brilliant. Um, so he, we're, can we're doing I, this thing where- Can I put him where... in my answer? <laughs> 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 right? Jason All Shiga. right, you're, you're bumped yeah. up to a B plus now, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I'm doing like the story part and he's kind of doing the, the structure. I don't know. I don't know how uh, long it'll take for us to finish because the structure he came up with, I feel like is slightly unpublishable because it's so complicated, but we'll see. Imagine we'll see that. how that goes, <laughs> right? Uh, and then the other person that I'd love to collaborate with is, um, is Jen Wang. Jen Wang, I think is one of the most talented people working in comics today. Um, she has a great grasp of uh, like the, the acting, like her emotions, um, the emotions of her characters just come out beautifully. Everything actually, like backgrounds, color, every, everything. She's, she's good at everything. But I also think it'd be kind of awesome to have like this book cover where it says Jean Yang and Jen Wang. I think it'd be kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jean Maris, who would you team up with? So. I've had the incredible opportunity of getting to work in situ with a bunch of different scientific research teams. And you mentioned that in my intro, I've done stuff on board the RV Atlantis, which had like the submersible Alvin, which is, you know, goes down three miles into the ocean um, and working in Antarctica. And the, the running joke is that like, oh, if they ever open up an artist in residence program on the International Space Station, like I'm there. <laughs> so, so I think, and I, I joke about it because like I, that would be probably, even though, like it would be the riskiest, I think, endeavor. Um, there's like a lot of a risk associated with traveling to Antarctica and there's a, a, like, you know, weeks and weeks of training to just be there and not die um, because elements, terrain, everything. So I take all that stuff seriously and I know that there are like all of these things that you have to do to prepare. But yeah, I think it would be like in a perfect system where I could just be like, yeah, I would love to go to space and then shadow the scientists and crew that are there and communicate like be on the ground or not on the ground in in space but uh having like seeing what they do and then making comics so it's like you're experiencing what i'm doing through them and that's essentially what i'm doing with the antarctica book right now so i love the the, the ability to get to go somewhere awesome and share that with readers because it's a place that you normally wouldn't get to go so that's that's usually why it's like where where's another place i can go that's like hard to get to but i can use my skill set to share that place with everybody else so yeah space 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 thank you all right so last question um Let's just talk about your favorite team in comics. Superhero team, scientific or historical team, sports team, even creative team. Who's your favorite team in comics and why? Who wants to kick this off? Any volunteers? I, can I, I'll go. Can I do two? Okay. okay. <laughs> My first link do two. <laughs> team intro to comics was not actually comics, it was cartoons and it was the X-Men cartoon. <laughs> um, that ran in like the 90s and like, but I didn't, I, my world into superhero comics was all cartoons because I was born in the early eighties and like, I, we didn't have a comic shop nearby and there was no place to get comics. So like Batman, the animated series and then the X-Men cartoon. So that like has a special place in my like kid heart. Um, but my favorite like team comic, actually it's funny, it's a Guri Huru, the Power Pack like comic is so good. And I didn't know who Power Pack was. And I just, that was my actually introduction to finding Dirk Guri Huru's art. Cause I absolutely love, love their stuff. So yeah, I don't, I, and sorry, I said two, but I'm going to do two more. All of my favorite sci-fi and fantasy are like big team ups. Like I love Star Wars and I love Lord of the Rings. And like, I don't, I can't pick a favorite character. I just love when everybody meets for the first time and there's all these different characters. Like, I think there's an inherent 
power in team. And some of that as a kid is being like, oh, which one am I kind of like the most? Or like, like, which one do I aspire to be like? And I feel like there's that thing going on, kind of like the personality twist, like, which Hobbit are you? And I'm like, oh, we all know what Hobbit I am. Anyways, but I, I do think like, us as a, like, humanity often gravitates towards those stories. So I, I'm glad that you asked this question, because I was like, I can't pick. I love all the teams. <laughs> I also love the X-Men. Um, I was a huge comics reader as a kid. Um, I got little subscriptions mailed up to me in central Wisconsin. Um, and specifically, like, the Claremont 80s, 90s X-Men, I think there's something about reading hundreds and hundreds, decades of comics, and seeing like this family of characters kind of grow and change and go through so many different like transitional periods, so many different fabulous costumes and hairdos um, and having problems with each other and growing and changing and, and new generations um, coming and, and working relative to the previously existing characters. I think that was so rich and interesting and kind of like opened my eyes to the scope of storytelling that's possible in comics. So, you know, yeah, yeah, X-Men. Uh, so I, uh, I, I have all of those old Claremont uh, X-Men comics, but I guess I'm, I don't think I'm as smart as you guys because they always confuse me. I can never make like heads or tails out of them. I just thought they were really pretty to look at. I, I reread <laughs> a bunch of that run um, a few years ago and I feel like the character growth was great, but a lot of times the overarching like storylines or villains were very hard to follow or like very yeah. mystical. Okay, okay, so it wasn't just or, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, They're yeah, but because of that, my too. my favorite team when I was a kid was was the Fantastic Four. You know, the original Marvel Universe team. I just thought that the four. I didn't realize that they were based on the four elements until I was much older. But I just thought the way they fit together was awesome. I just realized that now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was I was today years old. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, do you have a favorite team? That was mine too. Actually, I I, I looked through my boxes of comics, and I would have thought it was going to be the X Men. But I realized I actually have, I still have more Fantastic Four comics mm -hmm. than anything else. So I think it is the Fantastic Four. It's, it might be typecasting because, you know, there's a science-y thing going on there. Um, but the idea of a family of adventurers and explorers uh, really, that sounds, that sounds like a cool family to be, be part of. And the X-Men didn't always seem like a fun family to be part of. Um, Maybe that's so, why I gravitated towards them. I'm like, ah, there's enough dysfunction here for me to feel comfortable. <laughs> yeah, they were kind of like punk rock, quirky. Like mm -hmm. that, that was more of my, my vibe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I guess the other, the other team, again, I'm going to be super selfish, but I've depicted a couple times and I'm in the middle of another book, uh, the Niels Bohr, Albert Einstein team. Uh, nice. And they don't agree with each other on hardly anything in terms of science in it in but they loved each other as people and cared about each other tremendously and i think that's a i, re, I really like the way that pers, interpersonal dynamic manifested itself throughout their lives uh, it was it was really quite, to me quite beautiful what a wonderful note to end this panel on Maris, Jean, Chad, Jim, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I want to thank the CBC Graphic Novel Committee for bringing us all together. And again, many thanks to Comic-Con at home. I hope that you all have a great day. And I hope everybody who watches this video has, a, has learned something today. And please pick up all these amazing creators' books. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank this you. was great. Thank you. This was wonderful.